Hi, this is Lisa, and you are listening to I Love That Movie. This podcast is for movie lovers. It's not an unbiased opinion. It's not a straightforward review. It's just a couple people talking about a movie that they love. The format is each week I have a guest, and that guest and I discuss a movie that they love, something they're obsessed with, something they connect with. We'll talk about the plot, the director, and the actors, but we'll also talk about the personal connection my guest has with that movie. So if that sounds like something you want to listen to, keep listening. This is Lisa, and if you want to catch up with me on Twitter, you can find me at ILTM Podcast. I'm also on Instagram at I Love That Movie Podcast, and we have a Patreon. The show is always free, but if you want to support us on there, you can. That's at patreon.com slash I Love That Movie. Uh, basically, when you sign up, you get a bonus episode. It's my weekly roundup. People ask me a lot of times what my thoughts are on brand new movies. I'll share a little bit on Twitter, but it's a little more in depth on there. And then also I have a guest once a week and we talk about a show right now. We're covering uh, Marvel What If? So check us out on there. Um, and I do want to take a quick moment to thank my top patrons. They are Chris Balga, Jeff Widman, Philip Barker, and Michael Cross. Thank you guys so much for keeping the lights on. And if you like what you hear today, please subscribe and rate this show. It does help new listeners find us. Well, I've got a new guest on the podcast today. I've got Tyler. Say hi, Tyler. Hi, everybody. Hey, well, Tyler, this is your first time on the show. So why don't you take a moment and uh, introduce yourself a little bit? Well, my name is Tyler Patrick. I'm a huge movie person. I uh, <laughs> had a podcast uh, on movies that was short-lived because it was just a once-a-month thing and it was hard to find guests. Um, it was called The Requel Podcast. And basically what we do is we take a property and talk about if we want to reboot it, sequel, or whatever, and then we would pitch the movie to each other. Oh, nice. Um, I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like it was hard. You, you think it'd be easy to find people. Some people like didn't quite understand but uh, but I am actually the host of the Krypton Report, the all things Kryptonian podcast where we talk about uh, Superman, Supergirl and anything basically DC Comics related. Nice. Uh, so, yeah, that I mean, that's fun. I love it. You know, I've been doing it for my son is six. So about six years, a little I think wow. a little bit more. Um, that's and, awesome. Yeah, it, it is. And uh, it's crazy because like. Um, you just don't think about time. You, you really know? don't. You really don't. It it flies by. Like I'm like, oh, sometimes I'll tell a guest, oh, we we just I just had you on, and they were like, that was a year ago. And I'm yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you and I first touched base about recording, and it was in early 2020, and then you know, little things happen like uh, <laughs> here and there, a global pandemic in life, <laughs> and then we touch Gosh. base again. You know, so it's been crazy, and um, you know, I'm happy to do it because I, I love the idea. Um, of you just like inviting people and you know, it's you asking them what movie they want to talk about, you know? And I think that's yeah. cool. Instead of you saying, Hey, do you want to talk about this with me? It's you hey, saying, it takes a lot of the work out for me actually too. <laughs> Cause yeah, they have I'm, to come up with the ideas. But yeah, yeah I appreciate that. <laughs> and then you're like, they love it. So they'll just talk about it. And I don't have to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> I could just sit here quietly. Uh, it helps, especially if I haven't seen the movie a ton. Uh, speaking of that, my guest always picks the movie. Like you said, what, what movie did you choose to talk about today? Uh, you know, it was, for, it was, what's hilarious is, and I said this to you is when I first wanted to be on your show, I had the movie picked out. It was my all time favorite movie. Uh, which was that thing you do. And then right oh. as you messaged me, like, hey, you went on the show, you had just released your episode. And I was like, I, I, that is I, really weird. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's just funny coincidence. <laughs> and then my wife's like, Tyler, you're overthinking this. And I'm like, oh, you're right. And I was like, well, I was like, well, first I need to go back through her archives and see what's been done. And then I was like, no, I was like, I'm going to do the Wolfman, the original. And my wife's like, of course you are, because you're obsessed with that movie. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> um, and it's just so funny because you know, um, before you, you know, you asked me to do it, my wife had gotten me, you know, a little background on me is like, I am working on getting my master's degree in screenwriting. And oh, in my, awesome. in my class, I actually got an idea for my own werewolf movie. And I won't 
tell everybody what it is because I don't want to, you don't want to steal my yeah, idea. Yeah. You got to keep that. <laughs> your, you got to keep that inside. Cause if you, if you, I've always heard that if you like tell, pitch somebody your idea too much, you won't write it down. Uh, I've read, I, the, I, I wrote the script and I even like, Oh good. Okay. Like it came to that. me. It was like, I wrote, <laughs> I have the first script and then like I kept talking to my wife and like, I came up with other ideas and I'm actually in the middle of writing the second one. Like in a tri- like a trilogy, like I, I actually oh, have ideas great. for a third wow. story, that's, and like that's better than me with my ideas that never end up coming out. So it just, very impressive. It was just one of those things. Like it, it was like in my I need that spark, you know, um, mm-hmm. and I just had this, uh, and it was just like once I got the motivation going, I had I had all these ideas that were filtering in my brain, and I just went with it and the whole reason is I was writing it and I kept saying like I wanted to be kind of like in the vein of the wolfman like and we were talking and my main character is named after Lon Chaney Jr.'s actual birth name and we'll get in that when we get into the movie oh, nice. as, as tribute to him and um, my wife actually got a book for me that's the original 1941 shooting script for the wolfman oh cool um but it's also so much more, mm, and like then, more detail, more more background. I mean, it gives history on the the makeup, like the history of the producer, director, the makeup artist, wolf werewolf legends and lore, the Kurt Sidomak, the uh, screenplay writer, uh, his history and background, an interview with him, and then um, I had the movie on DVD that I've had for a long time. And my wife found a used copy of it on Blu-ray, the special edition. She got it for me, and it was tons of uh, special features. So I watched all these documentaries on it as well. And it was just so interesting. And like when we get into the, the movie itself, um, just certain things that were in the script that you know a lot of werewolf lore doesn't use. But now mm-hmm. that I know the origin and history of it, I'm like, I have much more respect for it. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so, you know, and um, but this movie has always kind of been like a part of me. Like it's, uh, you know, old black and white 1941. And there's a there's a certain beauty to old movies. I don't know how much you want me to go into like my history with the movie yet. Or oh, you can like go for it. Um, but I, I always remember watching these type of movies with my dad and my grandpa, you know, in October and Halloween. I remember my grandpa bought me the VHS tape. Um. For those who don't know, VHS was this uh, <laughs> thing before uh, digital and before DVDs. Uh, you can look it up on Google. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I told somebody at a work conference recently that um, the the last time I worked in retail it was at Suncoast, oh, and they wow. were so young they were like, "I don't know what that is." <laughs> there's like then, one still alive, <laughs> really. And, I, and there's a oh mall not too far from here that a friend of mine was at, and he took a picture, and I was like, "Oh, beautiful." I should have just been like, think laser discs. I'm not sure if they would have known what that was either. But oh, sorry I, to interrupt. Go ahead. <laughs> oh no, you're fine. Uh, I have that. I get excited sometimes, and I'll talk too fast. Um, laser discs are hilarious because I remember I was in elementary school, and they were trying to be like on the the cusp of new tech. Oh, just, for sure. And they I just in, that too, and yeah. they just invested in all these laser disc players. <laughs> and, everything. and I remember they came in like, we're gonna watch a laser disc, and she had it. And put it in, and I was like, "Wow!" And then I remember seeing, like, at the furniture store, the laser disc. And then all of a sudden, you blinked, and it was DVD. So. Yep. I mean, you know, they they looked great. They just kind of like CDs. They had issues, <laughs> or kind of like a yeah, CDs, but more so like records. They they could get scratched easy. Yeah, it's it's funny because there's always that one thing that's in the middle before the next big thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. I'm, talk- I'm talking to you, HD DVD. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember that too. Um, but I had the VHS and I, I loved it. And then when I was in third grade, I had the costume and I went for as the Wolfman, like the official universal Wolfman for Halloween. Um, and I'm never, I've never been really like a scary, like I don't like to like costume person. But to me, the Wolfman always had. There's something else about the character. We'll we'll get into that. Why it I love it. And, but I also think like my love for this movie also goes in companion with, um, the Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, Wolfman, and Dracula. Because, oh yeah. Because technically, uh, Lon Chaney Jr. is the only actor to play the official Wolfman 
Okay. Oh, okay. in all of Universal's movies, like there's been other Universal Studio werewolves, but the Wolfman was only ever played by him. Now hmm. Frankenstein and Dracula both had different actors portray um, them in in the Universal film series and everything. And but the last movie that Lon Chaney did as the Wolfman was the but uh, Abedant Luke Costello. And there's actually through if you look at the five film arc that he did, there's actually an arc to his character. And that's oh. part of why I love the character. Um, so, you know, I had that and I remember having being at Toys R Us with my dad and he bought me the junior novelization of the movie. And then, of course, back in the day, like there was like Doritos and Pepsi tie in with the universal monster. So I've always had a love for them. Like when we were in Florida, I went to the cafe and then um, in 97, I was at Kroger of all places. And I found a latex official universals Wolfman mask that I bought just to have (laughs) that I, (laughs) that I still have. That's pretty sweet. So um, that's really cool. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's just been like a, a movie and you know, I, I enjoy horror movies to a, a, a point, but I'm very picky about which ones and what I like. Um, and of course, you know, we, I don't want to dive too much into it, but you know, they did do the Benicio del Toro uh, reboot remake in 2010. Oh what, yeah. I forgot about that one. And what was interesting about that movie is good, but it has its flaws and I won't go too much into it, but I will say about that film is I love the, the costuming, the setting, mm-hmm. And Benicio himself. Yeah, I like Um, him a lot as an actor. I haven't seen it, but I like him. And to me, that movie, its downfalls was the twist, um, the gore. I felt like they went too far into that and they didn't need that for this character and this story. Mm -hmm. Um, I love the makeup of his look in that film. But the reason I bring that up, too, is it was actually released on 2-12-10, which February 12th is my birthday. Wow. <laughs> so when it, it came, released just for you. I was like, thank you. <laughs> nice. I, I can't think of too many movies that have been released on my birthday. Maybe I just don't. I'm not aware of it, but that's really neat. Um, Usually February is like romantic comedy or like dumping. Oh, that's out. true. Or like I don't know, Deadpool, I guess, came out <laughs> yeah. in February. And that, that came out in February. And that was like, you know, February is always kind of like one of the, the dead months of we'll try something or we think we have something kind of good but we don't really want to put it against competition. So we'll dump it in January or February. Yes. Um, which is weird because I don't feel that's the, the, the vibe anymore. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, when movies are released, it has sort of evolved and changed. I mean, everything about the movie industry has kind of changed, but. Oh yeah. yeah it's changing even more now. I mean, yeah. Like for example, you know, as we're recording this, um, they haven't dropped the new trailer yet, but scream slash scream five you know, is going to come out in January. That's so weird. And that, yeah, exactly. I'm like, that's weird. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, so it's like everything I just said about dumping stuff in January that doesn't really apply anymore, but yeah, anyway, all that to say, like, I feel the Wolfman's always been a film I've been attracted to uh, the original and it all, I think comes down to the story and the actor and the character and, and yeah. his, his journey. I'll well, let you talk now. Oh, no, you're fine. Um, So, you know, full disclosure, I think this is the first time I've ever seen this movie all the way through. Hey, hey. I think I've seen clips, but I don't think I've sat down and and really watched it. And I have to say, uh, you know, um, me and my husband sat down and watched it. um, And we both just it was it was so good. Like, I never looked away. And you know how, like, I don't typically have this problem with black and white films, but sometimes they don't, you know, you have to put them in their mm-hmm. time yeah, and yeah. the pacing and the excitement, it can be hard to keep your attention. Uh, that's not a problem with this movie at all. It came out in 1941 and it's so solid. I feel like anybody that sits down and just starts watching it. I mean, it keeps your attention the whole film. I think the pacing is great. It's really good. So that's one pitch I wanted to say. The other thing I want to say is 
if um, if you're listening um, and you haven't seen the movie like like how I hadn't seen it yet, um, I would pause here because we are going to talk spoilers. I don't really do like a spoiler free and then spoiler filled. So I would pause this recording. I would go watch The Wolfman. I rented it on iTunes. I think um, it's on Peacock right now. Oh, like, is it? Part, oh, okay. It's part of their October, I think. I could be wrong, oh, but I th- that's it cool. may have it may have been It is spooky season. So Yeah, that's what I'm I'm saying. Like I know they dropped a bunch of their monster movies, but it may not be one of the free ones. Okay, okay. Uh, well I'm actually trying to check right now. Yeah, I saw like I think when I tried to stream it, I saw the newer one was available pretty well, easily. Is, yeah, the new one is okay. So on Peacock, the new one is, and then the sequel to this one is on oh, Peacock. But okay. the, original but the original is not showing. Okay. That's, that's sad. Yeah. I kind of expected it to be like under like Turner Classic Movies on HBO Max and was kind of surprised it wasn't there. I feel but... like this year's spooky season, they've screwed us all over by keeping <laughs> yeah. a, lot of, a lot of stuff that usually would be streaming somewhere or something. Uh it's studios not. are like please go to the theater please <laughs> please please buy it please, <laughs> please please yeah so yeah um so i'm gonna go ahead and read the synopsis and then we'll kind of dive into some quick facts um so here it is wolfman 1941 when his brother dies larry talbot returns to wales and reconciles with his father and while there he visits an antique shop and hoping to impress gwen the attractive shopkeeper buys a silver walking cane that same night he kills a wolf with it, only to later learn that he actually killed a man. A gypsy explains that it was her son, a werewolf, that he killed, and that Larry is now one himself. Dang. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good one. It's a good yeah. One. Um, the, the first quick fact that I have is that in, uh, and I'm probably going to say this person's name wrong. Maybe you can help me. Kurt uh, Siodomek. Siodomek. I always pronounce it as Cytomac, but it's like Ciotomac. Okay, okay. Um, in- I heard it enough. <laughs> like I'm the so <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, you're the expert, not me. So in Kurt uh Ciotomac's original script for the film, whether or not Lawrence Talbot really underwent a physical transformation to a werewolf, or if the transformation simply occurred in his mind, was left ambiguous. The Wolfman was never to appear on screen. Ultimately, the studio determined that Talbot's literal transformation into a werewolf would be more appealing to the audience and thus more profitable, and the script was revised accordingly. This is true. What What are your thoughts on that? Like, what do you want to see an alternate version where you you never actually see the wolf, or um, how, how do okay. you feel about him? So that is true. Everything you said was true in the actual uh, shooting script that I have. That is true. The mm. scenes in the film where you blatantly see the wolf attack are not in the film or in the script they're not mentioned um the aftermath is and the only time the wolf is seen quote unquote is scripted in when larry is looking at himself through a mirror through a pool of water um it is left ambiguous and i think i think today's audience could deal with that um but they're i think back then it's not the kind of psychological type horror that the studio was known for and what they were looking for because they wanted a new monster. Yeah. That makes um, sense. So I think, you know, quote unquote, there is, there is another reboot planned with Ryan Gosling and that's all that's really known about it at this moment. And I think reading the script, you could go back to the original script and probably produce it. You could, I mean, you could pat it out and change some things. Like there's some, wordage and slang that you know doesn't quite work with today's um audience and you could tweak it and uh work out of that same script and i think if you did it like um there's a movie (laughs) there's a movie coming out that's just called wolf Mm -hmm. and if you i think it's just called wolf or something like that it's got uh lily depp rose in it and it's about like psychological people who think they're animals Oh. It looks like bizarre, but it could be really interesting, but it's not one of those every person's going to want to see it. And I think if you had watched that type of film where you're not sure back in the 40s, it wouldn't have really worked. I um, agree. I, I completely agree with you. I think um, I, I can totally understand why the studio was like, look, we need to see the monster. 
But I also kind of like the idea of like you're saying, maybe now they do do that version because I think it could be really effective and really interesting and be more of a psychological thriller. I mean, this already kind of is, but even more so. So I'd, I'd be okay either way. You know, and then having read it and knew that and watching it again, you can kind of see that play out. You, I mean, you could see it like at certain scenes. You're like, okay, I could see where this could be, could be done that way. You know, um, yeah, especially the interactions between uh, Larry and his father. Yep. Like where his father is just feeling so sorry for him about how far gone he is. Like, I think that's after reading that, that was something that I that kind of stood out to me in the movie. Like, I could see the behind the scenes of that a little bit. And I'm not going to say too many trivia things because I'll let you like say your trivia before I say too much. But, um, you know, but, you know, you look at Universal Studios at the time. It was known as a horror studio. Mm-hmm. You know, it was known for their monsters. That's what built that company, that studio. Um, so I think having not having what they were looking for, their product, like as in like the idea of a new monster, um, it it wouldn't have worked. Yeah, it, and we wouldn't have it. And I think even with the remake, I think you could do a wolf type movie, but you'd have to market it different because I think there's something thrilling about seeing the actual physical transformation that really helps um, sell the story. Yeah, that makes sense too. I I, I can understand that. Uh, the another one I had was um, that this film actually this one you already mentioned, but just to reiterate. Um, it, it marks the first of five appearances by Lon Chaney Jr. as a Wolfman, and and as you said, it's he's the only actor to play that character in every single film. I just think that's so interesting. It it, it is because if you think about it, Lon Chaney Jr., Bela Lugosi, Boris Karloff, those were like you know, those are your monster men, right? Yeah. Lon Chaney Jr. played Son of Dracula as Count Alucard. He played. The Frankenstein monster in um, Ghost of Frankenstein, I think. Or I'm trying to remember. He played the Frankenstein monster in, I think, Ghost of Frankenstein. Um, but yeah, it was Ghost of Frankenstein. Sorry, I'm going through my head right now. Oh, no, you're um, fine. And Bela Lugosi played the Frankenstein monster in The Wolfman Meets Frankenstein. Mm. And then Lon Chaney Jr. played the mummy in one of the latter mummy movies. Um, of course... Boris Karloff played the mummy. Boris Karloff was the original Frankenstein monster. Um, so you had this interchange, you know, ability. But when it came to the Wolfman, it was just Lon Chaney Jr. Interesting. And I think Why that's do you think that is? because you had to have Larry Talbot. That's what sold the Wolfman is the tragedy of Larry Talbot. Mm. That's what I love about this character is because, okay, so we'll break it down. Like, I, don't, I don't know how... <laughs> is the tragedy of Lawrence Talbot. Um, to, to jump back, in the original shooting script, he wasn't Sir John's son. Oh, really? Um, and having this new knowledge and reading, um, you, 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 you can see it in the movie, but the idea was he was an American that came to Wales. And then in the movie itself, all references to Wales is taken out yeah i i as i was reading that description i was like i don't remember that (laughs) but it's all over the script like it is all over the script Interesting. Um, and the idea was you have this american come into this town and like a greek tragedy and even kurt sadamak talked about this um hit the wrath of the gods was put upon him he you know Mm -hmm. he wasn't guilty of any sin but he was cursed and larry's a lovable good man yeah and that's and that's why you need Lon Chaney to make the Wolfman, right? Because unlike the other monsters, um, when he's human, he's really relatable, right? And that's the thing he's a good man who's cursed, mm-hmm. who is you know, and that's why I said like I love the character because of the arc. Is if you look at him in Frankenstein meets Wolf or the Abbott Costello film, Lawrence Talbot is actually trying to stop Dracula. He is actually, oh, he's, he's fighting like the good guy now. Exactly. He has taken his curse and he's trying to make something good. He, but when he is the wolf, he has, it seems like he has a little bit more control mm-hmm. over it. Like the Hulk. <laughs> in in <laughs> a way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is, you know, but that's, that's why I love the Wolfman is because I always saw him as he's a good man. 
Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of allegories in the idea of the Wolfman with alcoholism. Uh, Lon Chaney oh. Jr. himself uh, suffered with alcoholism, and it said that he was a great, sweet, lovable man. But when he drank too much, he became violent and angry. And that's mm-hmm. like, a, and that's an under theme of the film itself is at night you turn into something different. Wow. That's interesting. And also, I mean, you, you hear that story about people having alcohol or substance abuse problems. I mean, obviously that's still with us today, but I feel like it was really present in that time. And it, it makes me think, well, probably left over from the great depression, right? Like people probably had a lot of things going on because of that. Um, so Lon Chaney Jr. was born and he had a tragic life in a lot of ways. Um, he was born Creighton Chaney. Um, his father, if anyone who doesn't know, was Lon Chaney Sr., who is known as the man of a thousand faces. He was a silent movie actor and he played the original old black and white Phantom of the Opera, the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, Quasimodo, um, tons of early silent pictures and then on he actually helped pioneer and create the idea of movie makeup wow so creighton is raised in this but his father lon cheney senior would not allow him to be an actor he sent him to school to be a plumber to be a tradesman he would not let him act um mm. because he did not want a, the, his son to suffer the life that he did wow. and then when lon cheney died he left his son some money because Lon Chaney had, you know, uh, later in life had, you know, gained a lot of uh, cr- clout and had really done well for himself. But it took, you know, a lot of hard times. You know, we're talking in the 20s and 30s. <clears throat> yeah, I'm sure. And the day, like right after Lon Chaney died, Creighton quit everything and tried to start acting. And he had a rough coming up. You know, he even changed his name to Lon Chaney Jr., to try to help sell himself oh, um, interesting. and use his father, you know, to help build cr- uh, clout because he had been kept out of so much when he got older because his father kept him away. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, he had failed marriage. He had issues. He had, you know, um, his alcoholism. Cause one thing was he was his, when he was a child, he actually was born, uh, stillborn. And his father actually took him outside and dunked him in the cold water and it shocked the baby to life. That's insane. <laughs> yeah, yes, it Man. is. And wow. uh, Lon Chaney actually told his son that his mother had died when he was younger because his mother had problems, but she was actually alive in a nearby town. Whoa. And then, and then later on, Creighton learned that his mom was actually alive. Because and everything. Jeez, there's a whole um, movie right there. Oh, oh, there, t- there totally is. Um, so he has this tragedy built into him. And I think that's why he brings to life like his first screen role, the guy in notoriety was because he played the part on stage mm. was for Lenny in it um in um John Steinbeck's Mice and Men. Mm-hmm. Oh that yeah, I could see that. And you know, that's was his notoriety, and that's what brought him from being just like stuntman, you know, background actor, all this type stuff to being leading man. Wow. And um so there's all this built-in tragedy. So when he is up there as Larry, I feel like he's bringing some of himself of just that good-hearted man that people loved, mm-hmm. that so many people loved and fell in love with and just enjoyed being around. Um, so you know that having that knowledge and watching the film, like you're like, wow, like I feel like you're bringing so much more to the screen than people know. Yeah. No, I, I I mean I didn't know any of that. So that that is really interesting and, and will definitely influence how I see the movie when I watch it again, which I will do. Um the last thing that I kind of had listed here, um, to kind of piggyback off what you're talking about, about how, you know, he infused so much of himself and how this movie has such an impact on actually the lore going forward. Uh, many of the modern myths of werewolves actually originated from this film. Uh, a person becoming a werewolf through a bite. The only way to kill them is with a silver bullet. Werewolves and their victims being marked with pentagrams. Um, some are taken from earlier unsuccessful werewolf mo- 
movies like uh, Werewolf of London in 1935. Mm-hmm. Um, and others are original concepts created by writer uh, Kurt Siodmik. Um, actual werewolf folklore is extremely varied. In some, one can become a werewolf by being cursed or mm-hmm. making a pact with the devil or could turn at any time and were mortal and could be killed by conventional means. But later films added the details of werewolves being immortal again, uh, an invention of Hollywood and basically an excuse to keep the character back for a sequel, which obviously this really panned out for, for Lon Chaney having, you know, come back five times. So, well, what's okay. So real quick, one thing is in the sequel, which is the Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. You find out that Larry's body is buried and he's covered in wolfsbane. Oh, wow. And when they open the crypt and they take out all the wolfsbane and the moon is out, he turns and comes back. But he has a head injury. So they basically write it in that his father didn't finish killing him with the silver cane. Um, So they keep continuity, you know? Oh, okay. Uh, um, But here's something that I learned, okay? This is what I learned that I fell in love with when I told my wife this. I was like, it, it made sense. I always liked the silver angle because silver has been used in a lot of different folklores. For sure. And, you know, when you go into the history of werewolf myth, there's a lot of stuff that lines up, stuff that doesn't, like you were saying. Um, some of the oldest werewolf myths talks about putting on the skin of the animal and turning into it. Oh. Um, there was drinking the the water from a wolf puddle. and ro- There's a whole thing about um jupiter cursing uh in the lycanthrop lycan mountains i can't pronounce it correctly that's where the lycanthropy the lycanthrope terminology comes from um because they were cannibalistic people and he made them into beasts um but the pentagram five-pointed star kurt put that in and i have total respect for this now once i learned why kurt came to america because he was jewish and he was escaping when the nazis took over oh wow and he put the idea of being hunted because of a star dang that's heavy just the idea that his people were being hunted when they were forced to wear the star of david wow and i was like as soon as i learned that and i read that i was like okay i will accept that because that's something to me that's really built into the wolfman lore compared to other werewolf lore. Like I've had a whole conversation of what makes the wolfman, the wolfman compared to just a werewolf. Um, but I was like, that makes sense. Like he was a writer in Germany and then he came to America um, right as the speeches were getting hateful right before everything really went bad. And this movie came out the week of Pearl Harbor. Wow. That's insane. I, that's something <laughs> I never put together. till I was reading this and it was actually a successful movie. Like it did very well, well. You know, sometimes people want an escape. I mean, and, and that's part of the history of the monsters and of even Lon Chaney's career, because it talked about how during the wartime, the monster movies did so like, well, there was a resurgence and they did so well. But then after the wartime, Cheney had a little bit more issues back with acting and finding um, those starring roles and things again. Hmm. But, I wonder what's going to happen. Like I, I've heard people say like, you know, during the pandemic, they're like, Oh, you're going to end up with all these pandemic movies. And I'm like, I don't know. Maybe people are going to want to break. You know what I mean? Like maybe I think they don't want to sit through that. Maybe they want to sit through like something like this. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see how the audience responds to different films. I think there's people who are writing pandemic movies and they're just tucking the scripts away for like 10 years. Kind of like, you yeah. know, after, after nine 11, like we were really hesitant on anything that kind of showed certain things. Oh yeah. Like I would have definitely not cities. wanted to see that. Yeah. You know, um, I, I still remember- kind of, honestly, I'm like, like anytime a movie like that comes out, I'm like, I don't know if I can revisit all that. <laughs> it's just, it's just tough. Oh, I, I agree. I mean, do you, do you remember, uh, the first teaser trailer for Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. Oh yeah. Where it had him web the two towers together to stop yes. the helicopter, the bank that was taken out right? because it was all about not because of that, you know? And I don't think that people are going to want pandemic movies or a virus or like something, you know, I remember just 
my wife and I, when the, after the pandemic hit, we were flipping through movies. And we're like, oh, we'll watch Hobbs and Shaw. And that was about, a, you know, stopping a deadly virus. And I was like, uh, I did not know that. <laughs> you know, I just wanted, <laughs> you know, The Rock in an action movie. But Right, right. So I think we'll see that disappear and then it'll, it may come back later. And I think sometimes horror films like this, like monster films like this, is a way of talking about stuff, but not talking about stuff. Um, you know, it, the, the monsters or whatever I use as allegories and um, it's ways that we talk about things without having to actually put it out there. So we'll see, you know? Yeah. We'll see. So why don't we kind of um, talk a little bit about some of your favorite scenes? <laughs> okay. So the first one I'm going <laughs> to talk about, and I call this my favorite scene um, out of a humorous point, because it's the one time in the movie movie. I feel like there's the blooper. Um, so we have the first transformation. Okay. You know, Larry goes home. He's scared. And you can see it on his face. Mm-hmm. Lon, Lon plays it amazing. And he takes off his socks. And he sees extra hair on his leg. And he's like freaking out. And they do the, and I love that the director did this, is the first transition is just his legs turning into the wolf. Yeah. But if you notice, he's wearing gray pants and a an A shirt. I hate the other term, but a A shirt, white yeah. undershirt. And then he's walking out of frame. And then it's paired with him walking in the next scene. But in the next scene, he's wearing like dark uh like dark green black pants with like a button up shirt so somehow huh. the wolfman changed his clothes interesting i did not notice that at all <laughs> and that's why I, once. <laughs> I, jo- I joke and say that's my favorite scene um and then when larry wakes up the next day he's wearing the clothes he had on as the wolfman um interesting but i always joked because i was like wait a minute the wolfman changed pants he was like i'm not going <laughs> to go out in these pants um I, I just joke, you know? Yeah. Um, but, you know, um, one of my favorite scenes, I love the first scene where he comes out and it's just him walking in the fog. And, you know, he's walking on his his uh, feet, uh, you know, on, his, on the, the balls, tops of his feet, you know, mm-hmm. and he's coming out. And it's just a, it's a great shot of just him and he turns and, you know, I, I love that shot. You know, I love uh, another like scene that I love is when Gwen, the 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 love interest of the film, is being basically harassed inside her father's store. He comes in and just the way he tells the ladies who are talking trash about it, like, all right, you tell me. Come on. What was it we were doing? You know, he's like, tell me. And like how he, sta- he, you know, he stands up for her and he, you know, they're all kind of scared of him. Like, oh, well, <clears throat> this now they're like, they're not going to say anything, you know, yeah. um, they're too afraid to actually confront him. And I, I really like those scenes. And of course, later when, um, you know, it's a heartbreaking father son moment where he's, you know, trying to say, dad, stay with me. Yeah. And his father's like, no, you have to face this yourself. I'm going to go out there at the hunt, you know. And that's the last moment he shares with his father yeah. in, the, in the film. Like it's heartbreaking because you're, you're, you're like, you know, Sir John definitely is a horrible father. And there, <laughs> and I mean, there's a line earlier that's really good. That's easy to miss. And sadly it's not in my script because, you know, my script is the shooting script, but then oh. they did rewrites on set when they decided oh, to make him okay. Sir John's son. So some dialogue, you know, is altered and it's when he talks about Talbot men and their second sons, you know, cause it was his older brother that died who I guess was his twin brother. If you look at the portrait that's hanging, it looks just like Lon. Oh, yeah, you're right. And I always took it I as just, a, I'm looking at all the pictures on IMDb as you're talking. <laughs> um, and I saw that, that, um, that picture. I always took that as another way of building in duality that mm-hmm. wasn't explored. You know, oh, almost like, point. you know, Sir John has two sons that look the same. Right. But, but he took John because we, we can presume maybe it was Sir John Talbot the second or the third. We're, we're not sure, you know. Um, and that was, you know, because he talks about firstborns. 
And now it's about, you know, the prodigal son returning. And it's not so much maybe Larry's choice. Maybe he was cast out, you know, um, from his family or he chose to leave because there was no place for him. That's not as explored as much as it could have been because learning that what I did, that it was re- rewritten on set. Um, they didn't have that kind of time. Mm-hmm. So I love every scene with Maleva. Just the that wonderful old gypsy motherly figure Um, yeah i was surprised watching it like how kind she is to him i especially since i feel like obviously um in our society uh the way gypsies are often portrayed in media is not always positive uh or romani as you would say today um and um you know there is some sort of cartoonish quality to her and obviously Bella as well. But um, I think that they do a really good job with her of just, yeah, she is so incredibly empathetic because of what her son went through. And instead of like being angry at him and and punishing him for what's happened, she just immediately starts helping him. (laughs) And I just, I I I, find that really endearing. You know, you said cartoony and I feel like it's one of those things where, yeah, it is kind of cartoony, but is it cartoony because of her or no, is it because of no. she did what she did? And then over the years, everyone else has kind of ripped it off to where well, now also, that we see her. We're like, oh, it's kind of like that funny thing because we can't accept the original anymore. Well, she's also even in the movie playing a part because um, the way that, you know, Romani people are like perceived by everybody else and um, the way they have to like earn their money mm-hmm. is through entertainment. So she's sort of like in character hamming it up to get you know to get payment when she's doing her her job mm-hmm. so it's sort of like a multi-layer thing there you know with the, not um but yeah definitely no um critique on her performance of any in any way i'm just like i said pleasantly uh surprised by the way that, that she's portrayed actually i one of the well, you're talking about that like there's a great sign where um larry says to her she calls larry and he says I'm not buying. She goes, I'm not selling. Mm. And she's like, I wants to talk to him. And then she, tra- she tries to give him the pentagram charm to protect him. He's like, I'll, I'll buy it. You know, he shifts because he's trying to like, she's not pitching anything as a sale. She's trying yeah. to like, like, um, and he's like, okay, okay. You got me. You got me. Um, you know, the other thing is like you said, like her son, Bela and here, <laughs> here's okay. <laughs> Some things that I was interested in is, you know, did they not track the moon well enough to know that it was a full moon? Because sometimes in, <laughs> in black and white movies, you know, there's there's issues of telling what, like what's day, oh, what's for night, sure. what's like sunset. Watch, like, no you know, Sparatu, it's like I remember in film class them being like, OK, this is supposed to be at night. But keep in mind, like they didn't they couldn't do that. So like there's so many scenes of him like escaping or sneaking around and it looks like he's doing that in the middle of the day. They just didn't have the ability to film that at the time. It's like it's either bright day or dead of night there's yeah. no like and an interesting fact is there's no shot of the moon in this entire movie oh i hadn't even noticed that they just kind of talk about it i guess maybe they didn't know how to portray it and it's really great if you if you enjoy this movie watch the sequel okay. and, and which is the frank because there's little things like it's it's good it's not as great but it's good and if you're because you know there's a lot of things that are continued in it Especially if you're if you're enjoying Maleva, she's back. Larry, but um, there is shots of the moon in that. There's some great shots, and what I like is that was also written by Kurt. So I accept the changes. But you know, most people know the Gypsy poem in this film. Even a man who's pure in heart and says his prayers by night may become a wolf when the wolf's bane blooms and the autumn moon is bright. Well, in the sequel, Kurt changes it, and it's the exact same thing except the last line is. Um, when the wolf's bane bloom and the moon is full and bright because they wanted to emphasize the full moon and the bright because mm. if it's the autumn moon that just means they become a werewolf in the fall <laughs> you know like um but i just thought that was interesting that he changed it to to emphasize the full moon and yeah um so it's interesting that it does not appear in the Wolfman, which the Wolfman is so much known for the full moon. And it's just um, talked about. And I always found it interesting. Also, you know, like I, I took it that Maleva and Bella had a system 
you know, where maybe he was chained up, maybe he was put away or whatever, you know, when he it came that time to be tortured, when he'd have the mark appear. Um, but somehow this time they forgot or they lost track of time or whatever it was. Um, and Bela turns. And of course, one of my, one of my biggest issues with the movie is why is Bela a wolf? Like a regular looking wolf. <laughs> I guess they only had budget for one wolf costume. And also Bela's not, I guess he's not like as imposing as Lon is. And so, I mean, because I feel like that's like half the reason why he's the wolf man, right? Because he's a big dude. Like yeah, he's Lon like, Cheney was six he's, two. He six stands one, six, out. Two. Like he doesn't look, he, I mean, he he's handsome and he plays a leading man very well, but he doesn't have like the standard leading man look like you can tell he was picked because of his size in some way and like dracula doesn't have to be a big giant dude so like i feel like maybe the they made him more of a wolf because they're like look bella is not going to be like as big as and, and bella wanted this role too didn't he yeah he did he thought that he was going to be the wolf man um it was gonna be his comeback but he just got the gypsy part of bella so yeah. Bella, Pelley but I, Bella. I can see why. I mean, he just he doesn't evoke that like wolf quality. So I, maybe that's why they had him be more of a, a true wolf. <laughs> I mean, I, I I think one, I have my own like mythological reason I've retconned in my brain. I won't share because that's part of my stories. Um, two, I think it's to help really when Lon transforms. It's more impactful, which I kind of wish that maybe they had played a little bit more of. We're not seeing anything when Lon is attacked. You know, Lon Chaney Jr. was six foot two. So he's the same height as me. Um, I thought he was. Um, so, yeah, he he was, a, you know, he's a thicker dude. Like, he's not real frail skin. Like Right, right. He's a, he's a big guy. And what's interesting, another fact is the wolf that is that tax long was actually Lon Chaney Jr.'s dog Moose, who was a German shepherd that they found as a stray on the lot at Universal that Lon adopted. And he kept him around. And there's some really cool pictures of Lon in full Wolfman makeup with Moose just hanging mm. out. And they just used him as the wolf. Um so I, I think that's just, you know, it's interesting because, um, you know, the, there's there's a lot of interesting things about the makeup process and how it took a long time to do and how over the course, uh, you know, Jack Pierce did the makeup and he had a, he did not, he was um, a makeup artist who did not do foam latex. He was still, you know, he pioneered all this monster makeup. And then foam latex started and the first film to use foam latex was the wizard of Oz. And he did not want to do that. So there's little inconsistencies in the makeup. Um, and it wasn't till I think I'm trying to remember which one of the Lon Chaney performances where they started using foam uh, latex and stuff to apply to the makeup hmm. for the wolf to help speed up the process and make it easier for lawn that's like mind-blowing to look at pictures and think they didn't have that in the first movie oh I, I mean it's it's very interesting to just all of it you know and um you know here's another interesting fact was uh there's a scene in the script and there's pictures but they never filmed it where lawn or larry talbot was supposed to wrestle a bear <laughs> okay i heard about this but go on <laughs> and i'm just like and reading the scene i'm like yeah that was a good thing you cut that because it really makes larry look like a really mean person well i mean plus I, didn't I, the bear like get away <laughs> yeah. they're like um which, like that's so funny to me the bear gets away and they're like oh well i'm like no oh well where did that bear go you know <laughs> did that bear bite anybody like that just seems so funny to me it's like, you know what? We're not going to shoot this scene with the bear because uh, <laughs> he's gone. He's gone. He's, yeah, he's gone. And um, <laughs> it, Evelyn Eckers, who plays Gwen, like she was she actually ran up a tree to get away from the bear. Dude, I would. 
That's because... I always joke that like you'll never read a headline Lisa eaten by bears, Lisa eaten by shark because I will be nowhere near such thing. <laughs> Those like... animals belong in the wild, and I do not belong around them. <laughs> so. I'm trying to find a picture. Here, there is a good one. Maybe it's not in my book of lawn and full makeup with moose because it's just kind of cool because the dog's licking his face and he's got all his makeup on. Um, you know, and I could go on and on just about like the script and like some of the things they wanted to do with the imagery and like the um, the psychological torment, like when Larry g- tries to go to church, how mm-hmm. um, it was real edited around but like he's supposed to like walk up to the church and like there's light coming through the cross and it stops just at his feet Hmm. and like he doesn't see himself as a good person and what he's carrying this guilt and it's really a a story of of a good happy man like if you look at larry at the beginning yeah he's very he's very warm inviting charming yeah a little too charming trying to steal uh oh yeah <laughs> frank andrew's woman you know <laughs> yeah he's like yeah we'll just forget about that guy come with me i was like man her her boyfriend they they act in the movie like he's so out of line i'm like i don't know like i'd be upset <laughs> you know it's 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 very like <laughs> underlying like you know gwen likes frank they grew up together but she didn't seem like she was passionately in love with him and it's definitely a you know a storyline you could do well if you were to do it now and actually stick to the that script you know that storyline stronger than what they did in the remake they kind of made it that i didn't like what they did um i you know my appeal to this is i i love duality in the films like the curse like it's a good person struggling with something you know it's jekyll hyde but in some ways i feel like in jekyll and hyde um jekyll brings it on himself um yeah you said the hulk in a lot of ways, depending on your origin, because the Hulk's thing has been tweaked a lot, he didn't really bring it on himself. Um, you know, this is a person who got cursed, who is a who's good, who's living with something tragic. And, you know, um, my favorite Batman villain, for example, is Two-Face, you mm-hmm. know, and the duality of the problems of your, your side. And even, like, I say, you know, when it comes to, like, movies and shows and, like, I always, I always am drawn to like the good person, the good, like the true blue good person. Cause I feel like that's a lot of like who I am, but in star Wars, I'm drawn to Darth Vader and slash Anakin Skywalker, that story, because you have that duality. There is a two sided story to that character. Um, you know, where Obi-Wan says, you know, your father died and became Darth Vader. Um, so there is that duality of one person with two parts. Yeah. And the Wolfman, I think, is uh, the best example of I didn't do anything, you know, even like Larry doesn't really have a a classic sin. You know, he didn't kiss Gwen. He just was flirting with her, trying to steal her away, you know. And then what does he do? He tries to save Jenny. He runs when he hears her to help. Mm -hmm. You know, he's not running away. He's not trying to just flee. He runs into danger to help her and he gets cursed. Yeah. Very true. So so his tragedy is he gets pulled into this world of monster and the supernatural. And he's just an ordinary good man who wanted you know, he was he was just trying to have a date. <laughs> um so I think that is why I like the character because the wolfman himself is not evil. He is a he is a, a good person. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I do. I I also like that the two sides to his personality and how I agree. Like he 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 doesn't have any responsibility, even though he feels guilt, like it's his fault. He, it's actually not in any way. But yeah, yeah, I'm looking through here in the script, and it's like, you know, in the film, there's a lot of interesting talks of. Um, like one of my favorite lines is even though it's a horrible line is the police captain, Captain Monford says to Sir John, like when they're thinking about hunting and they're talking about, it could be a, uh, a diseased mind, you know, a person with a diseased mind. He's like, he said, even a, 
he makes a reference to a, a person with a diseased mind being fun and interesting and having that stuffed on your wall. And I'm like, that's a horrible line <laughs> of just the mindset of this person who, um, he, he's like the, you know, the police captain. And, yeah. Um, so I just, there's just a classic ness of, you know, the transformation that he goes from Larry into the wolf. And that's. I think just what is so appealing. Yeah. In the, in the film on, you know, it's, it's, I love watching the, the decline and of, you know, Larry's character where he just, people are talking like, Oh, maybe you weren't bit, or maybe you didn't have a blood. Maybe it was Bayless blood or, you know, yeah. maybe you did like, there, there's some really quick logic that has jumped by the police mm -hmm. <laughs> that I'm just like, wow, I hope there isn't any real murders. Um, <laughs> well, I think also though um, he implicates himself because he keeps saying things like, well, what if it's this? Well, I don't remember that. Or, you know what I mean? Like just sort of implying that he might be a danger or that he might've done it acting real nervous around them and stuff like that. It's like, he's doing that because he's a nice, honest person, but I think it, it ends up, you know, hurting him. Yeah. He's trying to be truthful. And he's like, you know, he's like, I, I killed a wolf, a plain, ordinary wolf. And they're like, you know, his father's like, it was dark. It was foggy. They heard the girl, Bela and Larry ran, you know, in the confusion, Bela was killed. Like, end of story. <laughs> you know, like, and they're like, what about his shoes? Obviously, he didn't have time to put his shoes on. He just ran to help. So, I mean, they're like quick logic, you know, um. It's, it's it's just and you can see it in in lon's portrayal of where he's he doubts himself he doesn't know what's real um so all that about is it all in his mind is seated in the film in the betrayal it's just the shots that we get of for sure it's a werewolf you know um especially when gwen sees him and does the great scream when he attacks her um there's a, a story about her that she was supposed to fall to the ground and then they're supposed to yell cut and she was laying there and they forgot to yell cut and they forgot she was still on the ground in the fog <laughs> and she passed out. Um, and one of the crew people tripped over and found her. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that'd be horrible. Like where's Gwen? I don't know. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's just, it's I don't know, it's tragedy. It's you know the the guilt of I didn't do anything, but I am being punished. And you know he's he's a wolf. He's an animal. And he becomes a killer, and you don't really see that in Larry. Like he, he doesn't he's that kind of a person. So yeah, I completely agree. I just, if they do remake the film again, I would love them just to kind of keep to the script, mm -hmm. the story, and just and flesh it out more, more of the estranged relationship. Yeah, it's interesting that they picked Ryan Gosling. I almost wish they would have picked somebody that was like tall and big and like, I don't know, that kind of echoed Lon Chaney in some way. And that's why I love Benicio Del Toro. And that's why I recommend yeah, if watching the that. remake just to see Benicio's performance because Benicio is a huge fan. Like he was a fan. He And the history of that, like there's really interesting documentaries on what happened in the making of that film, why there was issues and him portraying the character. And he tried for years to get it going. And, you know, some of the other interesting stuff I watched was just, hearing Rick Baker, um, makeup legend Rick Baker, who did the Wolfman for the remake, that the original Wolfman is what helped inspire him to want to do makeup. Wow. And of course, he got his first Academy Award for doing the transformation in, um, what do you call it? American Werewolf in London. Wow. It's a full and circle moment. Yes, exactly. And then he got another Academy Award for the Wolfman. And, you know, listen to him talk about that he knows so much of the history of the the process and of the makeup and everything for these old monster movies it's it's an amazing um listen as well just to learn about how these movies were made yeah wow 
Well, have we missed any uh, other scenes that you wanted to discuss? Um, I don't, you know, I'm just thinking like, I don't think really. I mean, it's crazy. This movie's only an hour and 10 minutes. I didn't realize I that watching it. Yeah, it, go, it, goes <laughs> it goes by. by. Really, yeah. It, you know, the, that some of the older films are. Yeah, they're shorter. shorter. Mm-hmm. Um, so true. In length. And, you know, an interesting tidbit was the budget was lowered because Universal looked at it more as like their uh, B roll movie, kind of before that was really a term. Well, and it doesn't really require a big budget because there's not a lot of locations. There's really only one creature. Like, I could see yep. them being able to cut corners. It's not like the creature of the Black Lagoon, you know, where they've got to be yeah, in the I water mean, and like, yeah. The biggest like budget would just funnel into the makeup. And yeah. uh, the last thing I wanted to do, I did want to point out was, um, the score, how strong the score oh, yeah. is. It's really for this good. Film. And I, you know, I, I know music, but I'm not a huge, like classically trained musician. Um, but one thing I was talking about was the Wolfman theme used what they called a tritone. Mm. And the history of the tritone was, it was a certain like three note uh, thing that the church actually considered like the devil's music or the devil's oh, song. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> and they, you know, and they didn't want to be used. So, um, they, they pushed the envelope it. with that. Right. So oh, like the idea cool. was it was a haunting already cursed musical tone Ooh. to even to lay over. Um, that's so to, interesting. Wow. You, you know, um, to lay over the, the wolf himself. So, yeah. Um, well, I, I highly recommend it. And I, you know, um, out of the older monster movies, it's not, it's in that camp where before they started to really push things to where mm-hmm. it really, they tried to push things, but they didn't really work. Yeah. You know, that you know, there's always that middle ground where we're trying to be modern, but the tech isn't there. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like the Wolfman is in a great part and, you know, it's, it's Lon's performance that sells it. And that's why I say, like, if you want, check out uh, Wolfman Meets Frank Hunt and then the Abbott and Costello version because you really love Larry. And that's why the Wolfman works. And I feel like if you're going to do, if you're going to really play up the angle of like the innocent, lovable, likable, no cares on my back, American, quote unquote, I could see Ryan Gosling doing that. Yeah, that's true. You know, and then. But trying to see, I think he can pull it off like the tragedy, you know. Um, but then, like when you see Benicio del Toro, the tragedy is just built into his eyes, much like Lon Chaney Jr. himself. Like you can see it in his eyes, even when he's happy, it feels like he's covering up something. And I think that all just adds layers to what makes the Wolfman great. I completely agree. Well, I was going to ask you, like my last couple of questions were going to be how you know what keeps you coming back to it why have you seen it so many times but i think you you kind of nailed it there <laughs> I, I think there's a relatability to yeah. it of just being that um because you know i think we're all like you know most people i think at, at our core we're good people but we do things that we out of character at times and it's like what is that am i am i cursed am i is there some driving force is there something that's causing problems um and you can you know in the monster world it's you know, the monster you know in real life maybe it's drugs it's alcohol or something that we're doing to ourselves um that's releasing the monster yeah i i think you know there's a lot of uh classic films that you could go back to around spooky season and um i really enjoyed this one i thought it was very easy to follow i thought it aged really well and and, and, you know, it was a really good, it was just a good movie. It was just a solid movie. I mean, it doesn't have to be, like, I guess it, it to me it felt like one of those films that even though it there it is a monster movie, it, it kind of stands out because it feels like anybody could watch it, you know? Mm-hmm. not you, you wouldn't have to be sort of obsessed with Universal Monsters to get it. Like, I think, I just think it's just solid. Well, most of your other films, the monster is more of the antagonist. Yes, um, that's true. And, you know, you look at your classic Universal template frankenstein's monster is not your focal character dracula even in dracula is really not your focal character um but in the wolfman our protagonist is 
the Wolfman. Mm -hmm. So we are on his side. We are following his story, his journey. Um, He's not being affected like in the other films where, um, you know, the, the mummy, the creature, they're all wreaking havoc. And then when they're not, they're kind of away. Like we're not really seeing what they're up to. But with, you know, we have the two, the two sides. We have Larry and we have the Wolfman. Yeah. So. Very true. Well, how do you pitch this to someone that's never seen it before? Um, I think if I was going to pitch it to someone, I was like, do you enjoy a movie that has heart, that has tragedy, that sees a hero go to his depth, but is, you know, cursed and. We watched, you know, the family drama and then, you know, uh, the Wolfman is, is that it. if you want something that's a little shocking, a little like thrilling, you know, I wouldn't even say scary. I'd say thrilling. Um, the Wolfman is, is great because you have this classic poetry to the film um, that has a lot of layers, especially the more you know about it, you can see the layers. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I think I think having that background that you've kind of talked about this whole time really really does enhance that it does and even you know even for me who you know i watched the movie not long ago and then when i got the book i read the book i read the whole book you know i read all the background straight through the script and then i watched the movie again right after i finished the book and i was like wow it it was like a new experience yeah i i would say kind of what what we said before is that you know um it, this is a classic film and it's definitely one that you should see. And uh, it holds I, up. yeah, I think it, it really holds up. And, uh, and, and I think that if you want to see everything that it influenced, you know, we talked about all the lore that came out of this after that. I know werewolves aren't quite as popular as vampires, but I mean, they have been around in cinema for a long time. And so it's good to come kind of go back and see one of the, the earliest renditions of it. And I don't think there's been really a great werewolf movie with the similar theme where we're with the werewolf as our protagonist who we're really seeing the sides like, um, like we are in this film. That's true. Like they're often just kind of like another monster. You know, I think Um, about like, I've been doing my own, like last, last uh, October was we picked um, werewolves and that was like our big, our big thing. And we were watching like every werewolf movie we could get a hold of. Um, except for like real low budget ones, you know? Um, so like I watched Wolf with Jack Nicholson. I watched, of course, this. Um, we did all the Underworld movies just for fun. And I think that's the closest you get to having a wolf-based um, creature in the Rise of Lycans that is our hero protagonist um, that we're seeing the both sides. Yeah. With Lucian. Um, you know, other than that, like, and then, you know, there's a show when I was a kid uh, high school age that's a campy like it was it's campy stupid but it's fun to watch and i watch it with my kids because they're little and they they giggle uh was called big wolf on campus and it was like a um, buffy the vampire spinoff but like just goofy i mean it's goofy <laughs> camp um and it was about a guy you know popular high school guy who gets bitten by a werewolf and becomes basically like a teen wolf type you know teen wolf like michael j fox not teen wolf um, yeah the later show, which is a, which was a good show. The first few seasons, um, you know, it was just a goofy, but he was our hero. You know, he was a werewolf that fought like the evils of the town. Mm. So like, you had all these like ghosts or monsters or whatever would show up and he would use his wolf powers to fight them, you know? And that's kind of where I think the wolf man to me kind of fell was like, you know, Larry would later go on to be a type of hero where he's going to use this curse to, battle the other real evils of the monster verse do you remember a movie called skinwalkers yep it was written by james roday from psych oh okay i didn't know that Had but it. i i remembered i can't remember if it's really good but i feel like i liked it i, I saw it a long time ago i was just trying to think of like other werewolf movies <laughs> um i remember watching it and liking it enough you yeah, know like i just it's i think it stood out to me as like not being bad like not maybe not being great but also not being bad oh, i'm trying to remember what the werewolf movie i watched was that had jason momoa and it had lucas till in it 
because it was one of those that wasn't horrible, but it feels like it started with a budget and then like the budget kept getting reduced. Um, wolves. It's just wolves. Hmm. Um, okay. And then also it, a movie called Ginger Snaps. <laughs> that's one I've tried to watch several times, but I never can get a hold of it. Oh, and really? Wo- okay. It, it's I, I remember it being pretty good, but I don't, I, I, I haven't seen that in a long time. Uh, wolves. I think it's worth checking out because it's just okay. interesting. Like it's, like I said, it, it's an enjoyable watch. It's got a decent budget, but you feel like something was kind of missing in it. Like they kind of halfway through it. Mm. It's on Amazon Prime. Okay, I'll check it out. Um, but like, you know, it's got Jason Momoa in it, so it's pretty sweet. Yeah, I mean that's that's a pretty big sell right there. <laughs> he, we we've met him twice, and oh, he was awesome so both cool. times. Yeah, he seems so sweet. Um, you know, but it is harder to find like good werewolf movies. Yeah. And uh, I, that's sad to me. So yeah, it's a genre that needs more. But um, Tyler, uh, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for talking about this movie. Um, you know, it's been a great discussion. Where where can people find you? Um, I'm like I have my own. You can find me at JTY Patrick on Twitter. Um, but I'm mostly on my podcast, which is at Krypton Report. You can find me on Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter. YouTube. I'm, I use those more than my own personal Facebook or Twitter. I, I just kind of get burned out sometimes on my personal stuff. Cause the other stuff is where I just follow uh, the fun stuff. <laughs> uh, I know. can relate to that. <laughs> well, thank you again for coming on the show. You definitely have to think up a, a follow-up movie and I'll write it down so that no one takes it <laughs> and then we'll and have you back soon. All right. Sounds good.